Hi. In this video, I'll be moving from talking about coding issues, learning about Flask and things like that, to more about the software development process issues. How is it that we're developing the software to begin with? What processes do we use to make sure that things aren't chaotic as we're developing, but kind of proceed in a nice, orderly fashion? And as you know, things differ, the process differs, depending on what you're writing. So in my case, it's pretty easy for me to write like mm, maybe a thousand lines of code in an evening without really any forethought, without any planning. Just kind of go ahead, understand a problem in my head, and do it. Then somewhere around 1,000 to 2,000 or 3,000 lines of code, that requires a bit of planning, at least kind of roughing stuff out on a piece of paper, maybe saving things to Dropbox just to keep some different versions, things along those lines. And when things get bigger than that, that's when I really need to do some serious planning and kind of sketch out what I want the code to do in some way, um, save stuff into Git. So it's a serious development effort of that part. And working with teams is even more important to really kind of plan how we're developing this code, where are we saving things, things along those lines. Here's this Arduino, a little controller board we're using in 110. And there in 110, people are writing maybe 50, 75 lines of code per project. So nothing we really have to write down. It's just trying to understand the basics. Pretty easy to do. And just as an aside about this board, it's fairly powerful historic, when you think historically. So that computer that controlled the Apollo mission to the moon was running at about um, 2 megahertz. And this Arduino board that the students use in 110 runs on 20. So it's 10 times more powerful than the computer that took us to the moon. And it has about the same amount of memory as that computer does, 30 kilobytes. Our big plan for this semester in 110 is to launch this Arduino into the air using a kite. The Arduino weighs three ounces, far different than the Apollo mission. And the kite weighs about 1.1 pound, so pretty light weight thing to do. And our goal here is to go about 500 to 1,000 feet in the air. The Arduino sits 250 feet below the kite. And as you can imagine, the software process that the Apollo mission software developers used differs greatly than the process we're using in that 110 class and differs yet again to that of the developers who are involved in writing the space shuttle software, a very complex piece of software as you can imagine. That software runs on computers that are not typical of a desktop or a laptop. They're 54 pounds each and have one megabyte of memory. So they're hardened. I mean, it's a very vibration-y thing you can imagine launching. And your laptop that you're carrying around here on campus probably wouldn't survive that trip. And plus, there's radiation in space that we have to consider. And the task the software has to accomplish, it's controlling on a 120-ton shuttle. So something fairly large and complex with lots and lots of sensors. It's controlling how 4 million pounds of explosives are being used. That's a bit scary to think about, being a developer doing that sort of thing. And to accomplish all this, there's four identical onboard computers and they're running identical software that this team has developed. And they're pulling data from thousands and thousands of sensors. And they're making hundreds of milliseconds of decisions by voting. So a fairly complex thing, all these computers are deciding, making a decision, and then the, the results of all these computers are compared. So what, what is done is actually a vote by all these computers. And there's a fifth computer with entirely different software on standby. So a computer that accomplishes the same tasks, just written by a different team. And all these computers, and this whole computer system, 
controls three humongous engines on launch. If you've ever seen these, they have these gimbals. They kind of move around, so that's sort of critical, and you'd think that would be a tough task to do to actually um, move these engines around. And they also give the orders to blow the explosive bolts that separate these solid rocket boosters from the space shuttle. So all these tr complex things that this software has to control. And a developer having an error in their code, a bug, is really, really a bad thing. One of the developers on the team said this, that if the software isn't perfect, some of the people we go to meetings with might die. A scary thought if you're a developer. As an aside, uh, the International Space Station in 2013 was doing an upgrade of their computers. Here's uh, Chris Hadfield, the famous Chris Hadfield, saying, Good morning, Earth. Today we transitioned the space station's main computers to a new software load. Nothing could possibly go wrong. Hmm. A short while later, the space station loses contact with NASA mission control. Something did go wrong. The only way they could contact Earth was on their, when the short time they were over Russia, they could communicate with old school radio transmissions. Okay, let's go back to not 2013 developers, but the developers that wrote the space shuttle software. And people consider this space shuttle software the most perfect software humans can write. Um, the last three versions of the program, each were about 420,000 lines of code, source lines of code, they each had one error each. And the last 11 versions had a total of 17 errors. That is absolutely phenomenal. Equivalent commercial programs, the Microsoft Word, whatever operating system, any commercial program you can think of, with that amount of source lines of code, would have 5,000 errors. The industry average is about 15 to 50 errors per 1,000 source lines of code. And the space shuttle software, just really, it doesn't crash. It doesn't need to be rebooted. It can't, I mean, if when you think of it, it's kind of hard to reboot. Or if you, the computer crashes, you're kind of sunk out there in space. So you can see why these would be critical issues. And you may wonder, well, you know, how could they accomplish this? How could they be so great at writing this software way back when they did this? And we're really pretty sucky now about how, we're, how many errors we're creating. And the thing is, we know how to do this. It's common sense sort of stuff. So just stop the video for a moment and think, well, what would you do to get rid of all these errors? How, what would the team have to do? So hopefully you've stopped the tape, kind of figured out what you would do to do this. And let me just explain what they did. It probably matches your list. So we've heard of game developers. The average amount of time they work per week is 80 hours a week. They're constantly in this state of exhaustion. Well, these NASA engineers only worked 9 to 5, 8 hours a day, no late nighters. Working until exhaustion creates bugs and lots of them. So you can see why this might be an important first step. Be fresh. As you can imagine, you just don't shoot from the hip developing stuff and everyone developing on their own thing, but even small fixes required planning. So the spec for a change, for example, that took about 6,000 source lines of code had so that the specification of how to write and what were the requirements there took about 2,500 pages of written detailed plans of instruction. 
Here's another obvious one. So instead of just having the coders code, you, we break up the developers into two teams. One team writes the code initially, and the other team, and this is kind of the not fun job team, is the, are the verifiers, making sure that code is correct. Finally, the fourth line, or the fourth item, is that every line of the code is annotated. If it fixes a bug, what bug number does it fix, who was the developer that changed that line, and so on. So each line has a history. So not rocket science type stuff. I've had some limited software development experience. Um, let me just tell you a bit about those. So the first place I worked out of grad school was a place called the Center for Speech Technology Research at the University of Edinburgh. And there maybe we had mm, 30 pages of documentation. There was a development team of about three people. No real method to our madness kind of in developing. The next place I worked at was IBM uh, in their operating system division, developing OS2 Warp. Uh, and that's about 7 million lines of code. When we worked in Boca Raton, there were 2,000 developers, and they downsized and moved 1,000 of us um, to Austin, Texas. It was a very regulated environment, as you can imagine. Um, if we, one person checked out a file to make changes, they would have to check that file in again before another person could work on it. So sometimes we'd be called late at night when we were at home to come back in and fix um, to, to, to recommit a file. If we wanted to make a change because uh, to fix a bug, we would have to get permission up the chain before we could fix that bug. Um, the next place I worked was the Computing Research Lab at New Mexico State University. I worked there for about 10 years on a variety of projects. And the best thing I can say about it is I really learned all the wrong ways to write software. So where two people would work be, or two teams would be working on a project and only get together a year later to com combine software uh, efforts. And I also worked at a few startups, uh, very limited experience there. So my experience is just one data point of how to write software or what the process is when we're working in teams to develop software. But it still leads to the question, all this, of what's the right way to write software. Is this NASA way the way to go because we can really guarantee that we'd have one error? Is it the IBM OS2 operating system method the correct way? And the best we can say is it really depends. Right? The shuttle software has to be the way it is because it really is life critical. If we're developing software for medical devices, equally critical. But if we're trying to develop web apps, we don't want to write in the NASA slow way of all the specs. Our goal is to make big bucks. Our goal is to get this IPO and become millionaires. We can't wait around and have other well, and perfect bug-proof software where other companies are going and developing stuff fast and getting the market share. We want to be fast, rapid development, and we can put up with bugs. So that's the method I'm going to be explaining. How modern software developing teams, people developing web apps, are kind of ignoring the fact that you know we're going to put up with having some bugs in order to get software out the door and being used by people. And the method used by lots of the development teams is a method called Scrum. And that's what I'm going to talk about in more of a formal way right now. Most software development isn't like the shuttle or isn't even like working on an IBM operating system. Especially today in the web apps, you know, you're not going to wait around for how a year to release something just to get all the bugs out. You'd rather release early, make some buzz about what you're doing, be the first online, and you know, do rapid development. And a good way and we want to rapidly develop because we don't want to follow paths that lead to dead ends. We want to like try things out quickly and see if they work. So this is where this approach, this agile software development with Scrum comes in. You'll learn much more about this when you take software engineering. This is sort of an introduction to it and how we're going to use it in this class. 
So Scrum, it's a method of software development, and it doesn't stand for anything. And I just grabbed some pictures of Scrum. It comes from this rugby term and beats me how it relates. But there are these pictures. So what it is, it's an interactive incremental method of development, and it differs from traditional software development methodologies. So the stuff we use for developing an operating system and the approach we use is different. We wouldn't use that same approach in a web development shop. And it's all based on this, that you can't really figure things out ahead of time if you're developing an interactive system. And all these modern things are pretty interactive. So these web apps we're developing are highly interactive systems. And it was based on this initial book, this Agile Software Development with Scrum book by Schreiber and Beetle. And I'll let you know, I'll give you kind of a quick overview of what is Scrum and what the spec is and how I'd like people to use it in this class. And I'll annotate its spec and class in these next slides here. So there's someone called a product owner and that person creates some wish list which is called the backlog. So you sit around and think, well, you know, I'd like a site that does this with dog owners that where people can arrange dog get-togethers and blah, blah, blah. So you kind of go through, make a list of, oh, I'll go into more detail later, but it's really what you want this product to do. Then the team gets around and sprint, and we're working in sprints, which I'll explain shortly, uh, that will decide on a small chunk of that wish list, that backlog, what we're going to work on for this period of time. This period of time is called a sprint, and we're going to decide how to implement th these pieces of things we want the product to do. And this team has a certain amount of time, a sprint, which is usually two to four weeks to complete the work, and every day that team meets to discuss its progress, and that's called the daily scrum or the scrum meeting. Then there's this person called the Scrum Master. That person's responsible for keeping the team focused on its goal. So at the end of the sprint, the work should be either shippable, ready to hand to a customer, put on a store shelf, or show to a stakeholder. So it's really a demo of some quality depending on where you are in the process. But you're working in these incremental blocks of time that are called sprints, rather than working like a year. I worked at, when, when I worked at the Center for Speech Technology Research, uh, you know, we wouldn't put things together for, we had a big failure once when we couldn't put things together. Two teams were working independently on two different aspects of the project. One team got, the team I was on, uh, was responsible for getting some information. The other team was developing the engine that would use the information. We successfully wrote the thing that got the information, but at the end of the year, we realized that what we got wasn't in the correct format the other team needed. So this would be completely reversible of how sprints would work. In sprint, in two weeks, we'd have some sort of cruddy system that would have this complete flow from grabbing the information to using the information. Very early on, we'd start developing that interface rather than wait a whole year. So these, having these two-week sprints are really useful. So the sprint ends with the sprint review and retrospective, like how do we do, what's the scoop, you know, what do we need to change here. Then there's another sprint. So every few weeks or every month we work, we decide on a, what we're going to accomplish in that month, go ahead and do it, and the process repeats. So it sort of looks like this, that we have this product backlog of things that we'd like our product to have. Then we have a little planning meeting of you know what it is in that backlog that we can accomplish in this um, hunk of time. That's called the sprint backlog. And then we have that daily scrum meeting on the top just to keep track of our progress. And every two to four weeks, we have some sort of shippable product increment or at least demoable product increment. So the spec calls for teams to be pretty small, about five or eight members in a scrum team. But for us in this class, it'll be whoever's in your product, in your team, maybe two to five people. You can do it individually again, but I really would prefer people to work in teams. The scrum master manages the teams responsible for success. Often it's the project manager, you know, someone hired really to manage this project. For us, your team will just elect the person. 
this product backlog, I'll talk more later about it, but really it's a prioritized queue of what function we want the app to be. So it's a list of features, functions, bug fixes. So if we later on in our second release see that we had a, a problem with the first release, we go and fix that bug. And only one person is responsible for maintaining the product backlog. This is because of this reason, that you're working along on what you think is important, and off comes someone, not your boss, but someone else that says, hey, we absolutely need this feature in this next coming release. The, our customer requires it, or you know, it would really be cool to show it. And we kind of get interrupted in our flow of what we're actually working on. Here, with this very sprint-oriented backlog of how we're doing things, we don't accept those distractions. We work on the task for that one sprint, and we don't get the, either distracted by other people thinking, hey, we should add this cool feature, or ourselves thinking, hey, you know, I can add this cool feature, I'll do blah, blah, blah. So we're just strictly focused on the tasks for that current sprint. Um, so, for example, if we were doing an IRC project thing just to see what that would be like. We'd have a backlog like, well, we'd fork the IRC project. We need to do that. We need to get to the basic system working. We're going to work on that login. We need a database behind this. And when that user logs in, they'll see the list of previous messages. And we need to do search. So I just grabbed the, all these from the spec of that rudiment. But you can see what it'd be like that we'd have a list of things we need to, of functions we would need and, and things we need to do. So the person responsible for this is called the product owner, and that's the customer representative. And as I gave in that example a second ago, no one can make end runs around this product owner and say, hey, we really need this other feature. And the spec is that the product owner can't be a member of the team, but for uh, the purposes of this class, someone on your team will be that product owner. The person that had the idea initially is a good product owner because they have kind of in their mind you know, how things should be in this product. So the sprint is the period of time that we're working on, uh, and it's a one development cycle. Usually in the real world, it's 15 to 30 days, but in class here, it's going to be a little shorter, about one and a half to two weeks. And at the end of the sprint, there's a release, which may or may not be public, but for us, you're going to be demoing this release in class. So the process is this, that you're going to meet as a team, you're going to look at this product backlog, decide on what you can accomplish in the next week and a half or so and you commit to yeah we can do this and you'll divide the work among the people in your team so everyone has a specific responsibility these scrum status meetings are very structured instead of saying hey how's it going what's you're up to i'm working on this and blab about it for five minutes that where there's a spec that we have these daily meetings often they're um, done standing up. They're, in some companies, they have these little standing, very tiny desks with a monitor. So you hook up your laptop, hold the scrum meeting in the hall there, and you off you go to work in a way for the rest of the day. So the scrum master enforces the rules, runs the meeting, and it's just a few minutes long. And what's covered is, starting on the left, each person answers three basic questions. This is what I, do, I have done since the last scrum. And to th between now and the next scrum, I'm going to be doing this other thing. And here's the hassles that got in the way of what I've been working on. In the spec, the scrum master writes impediments on a whiteboard or something. Like some impediments might be, you know, I was going to work on this, but I can't install the software. or I'm not sure how to do this whatever, and it's the job of the scrum master to fix the impediments. Not during the scrum meeting, the meeting is very short, but figure out a way saying, well, after this meeting, we'll discuss how to install blah, 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 whatever it is that we need to do. So that's it, it's a very short meeting. Don't get distracted into thinking it's some long convoluted thing about, you know, here's how to do these problems or here's what I've done. It's just about status. If there has to be some design meeting, brainstorming meeting, some information about how we're going to do stuff, that's after the scrum meeting. And it's all about transparency and trust. So everyone should know what everyone else is doing and trust that people are proceeding along, focusing on this task and not getting distracted. So every one and a half to two weeks, you'll do a, some demo 
in class just to have other people see what you're working on. You'll also put the code in uh, GitHub. So that's it for Scrum. I said Git, and that's what you'll be working on. So one team member will set up a repository for the project, and each team member will contribute to it. Um, there's a problem here compared to other years I've taught the class. In Cloud9, when you make a commit, it's you'll be sharing the workspace probably. It'll look like one person's making the commit. Before, when, uh, before we were using Cloud9, I could do a git blame and see who uh, submitted what. So that's Git. I'll talk about more about that in a little bit. So the requirements are to use the Scrum process, use Git, keep track of the product backlog and the sprint backlog using this product called Trello. Trello will, allows you to do things like this. It just manages lists. It's very easy to do. It just gives a little structure that might be helpful. So each project will have a Trello page. You make it public. You'll be sending me the link. Make sure I can actually look at it. It has to reflect what people are currently working on, what the current sprint backlog is, and all the tasks must be assigned to single identifiable individuals. So we know if something's not working, we know who to blame. Or let's look at it more positively. If something looks great, we know who to say, hey, that was a good job. And it has to be up to date. Keep, you know, It can't be something you did once at the start of a week and a half and you know it's no longer what you guys are really working on. So the requirements for this first sprint are for pretty minimal. Uh, I want a clean web website working in Flask. You need each person on the team writes code that uses PostgreSQL to access a single table. There's probably will be multiple tables in the database, but you only need to access one with each query, and you should follow Scrum and use Git correctly. So think a bit about what some cool ideas for web apps are, especially mobile web apps. Here are some uh, examples from previous semesters. People did this doodle in class, uh, take a picture of your doodle and post it, and people could make comments about those doodles. Uh, but you see a whole slew of other ones, some successful, others not so successful in their final outcome. So the key here is just to pick something that's f interesting and fun for you. And that's really the key of you know making it put you putting in some time for it rather than me arbitrarily selecting a topic. You'll be covering a lot of this back in four once you take 430 software engineering. They use Scrum, they use Git, but we're just getting kind of familiar, we're gaining initial familiarity with these concepts. That's it. I'll be posting some short videos on Trello and Git shortly. Take care. See you next time.